Boom. I'm sorry. I'm being on in Teams on Excel. A big flash thing came said, work together on Excel. So everyone get out of your Excel. Let's get to work. We're not going to use Excel. Do you know that? Who likes Excel? Who has used Excel and has changed their life? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and also we're going to do a little bit for today. Let's review then from Friday. Remember, remember way back when on Friday? That was a long time ago. So, which of the two sections, North or South, had the most diversified economy? North. And what did that mean for immigration down the road? Yeah, you're really going to see it. Go to the North in this era. You really should switch this. Back up here so I don't have to walk as far. When I have it right here. Okay. <laughs> So it's hard, all right. And so, yeah, so more people went to the north and yeah, much more diversified economy. We'll see this big shift coming in down the road. Oh, what was the rebellion that led to the slave codes? Yeah, and yeah, racism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, racism came out of that. And what were the laws they passed? What's the most important of the slave codes? Fornication laws. And, oh, what is it called how either individuals, societies, or countries deal with scarce resources? Economics. Economics. What was that economic policy by the British to accumulate as much gold as possible? Wow, we're good. We'll do the test right now. Yeah, let's go. I will be giving you a list of the tests at the end of the week. We have a test next week. The list will have nothing to do with that. To be honest, that's going to make you feel better, like a security. <laughs> I will give you a lot of hints. First test, I want everyone to do well, because like a lot of things, the questions will seem very hard at first. You know, just because you first time getting all this stuff done. And oh, back to what was the trade right along here that that would lead to King Philip's War? Yeah. And what was King Philip the British butchered that name? What was his actual name? <laughs> well, we were butchering with Metacomet, but at least it's more appropriate. Who won the war? Well, the natives, well, the natives decided natives. to be like Jeff Frank, shot all of them, and then we You and I? <laughs> the English colonists, yes. The English colonists won. And so, and that's one thing, just give me a hard time there. When you write an essay in class, we'll talk more about what we what I require for essays. We'll start with short essays and we'll bring out do a longer essay because you understand. Try to avoid first person personal pronouns. I'm you know, obviously I know what you meant as in the United States, but don't write we as the United States, right? Yeah, the yeah, United yeah, States. I don't have any in this final semester in the I'm not I mean, I am pretty old, but I'm just under the age. <laughs> just under the age. Yeah, you're right. And or don't put like we did this, or don't put down. This is pretty common. Like, and you will get rights. You know, we all do this in class when we talk. But don't say you will get rights. Put down that citizens of the United States. It's a, it's a, just a habit to get out of. In conversation, we talk in class. We yes, boom. That's fine. But try to avoid that, get to where you don't have to do it. It just makes it much more precise. And it's one of those things where they're supposed to take points off on the APs. I mean, the person grading it is supposed to dock you for that, or, or part of the consideration. But wouldn't you hate you lose points because you just accidentally put down the three? You know, one of those stupid little things that you know better, it just came up to your writing and kind of getting tired. So get out of the hat. All right, so back to this. Did we get to Wars Empire. Did we get to King William's War? So let's go through all the wars. We got lots of war. No, all you have to know is just the big thing. I want you to get an idea of how these wars stacked up in the colonies. I'm referred to them as the English colonies. They call this King William's War, 1689, 1697, and this is what I mean for the the British colonies called this. Don't write this down. I'm just putting this down there so I just have, give the context. In Europe, it was called the War of the League of Augsburg. I know what you're thinking, and thankfully, we've mentioned Augsburg in class, right? 
And it is my favorite Augsburg related war. You may know what country Augsburg is today. Yes, it's German. I've been to Augsburg. That's I've got really the my whole story. That's just kind of cool place. Really in the mountains, really pretty. Let me tell you. And what happened was Louis XIV was attacking all along the Rhine River, trying to get empire for mercantilism. In fact, that's where the term mercantilism comes from. Are these wars right here? Well, in Britain was King James II. King James II was leaning towards and looked like he was going to force England to become Catholic again and maybe take away power from Parliament. Remember, they just fought a civil war 40 years early. They led to Cromwell, horrifically bloody war, which will have great effect on the United States down the road. But anyways, he was overthrown by Parliament of the Glorious Revolution. But they had to find a Protestant king. And finally, so where did they go? They went to the Netherlands. The king of the Netherlands, William, had married King James's sister. And so he had a connection. He was Protestant. And so they brought him over. Since the Netherlands was at war with France, guess who now is at war with France? Britain. And that's how the US, the US, that's how Britain got in that war. And I should have William and Mary didn't have an heir. So they got to find somebody else. Okay. Also, Parliament would pass a law saying that no monarch can be Catholic. They all must be Protestant. And that is the law to this day. The monarch of England has to be Protestant. Yes. Protestant is somebody who broke away. The term actually becomes from protesting, broke away from the Catholic Church starting in 1519. Uh, so is it Protestants are Christians. Protestants are Christians. They just broke away from the Catholic Church and formed like the Lutheran Church, or in church, it's Church of England. In the United States, Church of England is is called uh, Episcopal. I say Episcopal. I might just throw it. Yeah, Episcopal, which is also called Anglican. Yeah, they, but they are Christians. And so they have the same, they just said they're not Catholic. AK Catholic, all Catholic means it's the church. That's all Catholic. It's the church. And they tried to be the only one in Europe, didn't work. So this war turned out to be basically a draw. And in the colony, even though there's a lot of fighting, the French used the rivers and attacked the English colonies using their, uh, with their allies. It went to what's called the status quo. Status quo means back to the way it was before the war. Back to the way it was. In fact, stat, there, there's a whole series of status quo, antebellum. Status quo, the way it was, antebellum, before the war. Anti is before, bellum is war. Some of you might have heard about the period before the Civil War in the United States, sometimes that's called the antebellum period. All that means is before the war. That's all that means. I mean, in antebellum itself. Yes. Hmm? Yes, quick go. But next time, get the drink between periods. All right. So, Queen Anne's War. That'd be the next war. So, Mary's sister, Queen Anne, became queen. And there is a picture of Queen Anne, very stylized. She is going to be tortured for her whole life. This, once again, don't write it down. It's the War of the Spanish Secession. This war actually did quite well for the British and the colonies. But, and there'd be fighting, bloody fighting along the frontier, especially with allies, American Indian allies of the French fighting English colonists. But once again, another colonial status quo. Even though the British did well and got actually did quite well in the treaty of the Treaty of Utrecht after this war. But poor Queen Anne. Queen Anne, she didn't have an heir. She'd be pregnant 17 times and only a couple lived to the age of one, that's it. And she somehow survived. One out of three pregnancies at that time ended in the death of her. The pregnancy is still very very dangerous. You have to be very careful. But it was so off the back of 
That is why back then the life expectancy of women was so much lower than men. And because of modern healthcare, medicine, um, vaccines, um, women now live longer than men. But that wasn't until the 20th century. And so Queen Anne, it drove her crazy. She couldn't have an heir, all the pressure on it, the absolute agony and pain she was always in because of that. And so she's actually just a tragic story. She kept rabbits for each one of the babies who died. She wanted something. And I guess it was just, must have been surreal in her room. She had 17 rabbits. She kind of figured out her kids. She was just, it's awful. Poor Queen Anne, but great sympathy for Queen Anne. And when she passed away, the closest relative was Catholic. So they had to go find another family. The royal family and a little principality right here called Hanover. There's no Germany yet. These are all little principalities and small kingdoms like Austria or Prussia or Hanover. Cousin, Protestant. Boom, we got the Hanover Indians. So King George would come over. King George, he's German, spoke German, King of England. His son, King George II, spoke German, King of England. King George III, who would be king when the United States became a country, was still German. Mom was German, father was German. That family would die on. They never had an heir in the 19th century, so they had to go find another heir. They found more Germans. Sat Skolberg. And in World War I, they changed the name because Britain is fighting to the death of Germany. So they changed the name of the royal family from Sachs Holberg. They named them after the castle they lived in, Windsor. And it is still the house of Windsor today. And so the King of England is German. One of those surreal things. But that was actually pretty common. The Tsar of Russia at that time was German. Just kind of, that's a German family. Oh, and they're all inbred, but that'll be another story for down the road. So, the next war, and I know what you're thinking. We haven't had a war ear-based. Let's have an ear-based war. The War of Jenkins' Ear. And this is one of these bloody wars literally called the War of Jenkins' Ears. So it's Britain versus Spain, but Spain was an ally of France for various reasons. And this would roll into a massive war with France again. But we mentioned this because we can get to what's called a privateer. Does anybody know what a privateer is? Yes. Isn't it like um, sailors or like pirates that have been hired to go be pirates elsewhere and attack other ships that aren't like English or French or whatever? Yeah, that they can literally be, they're pirates, by all measure pirates, or something like them. But they're hired by Britain to attack Spanish or French ships. Mm -hmm. And so they could claim, no, no, we're not pirates. We're working. We're actually soldiers for Britain. Now, let's be clear. They're pirates. But that's a privateer. Britain did that against the Spanish. It was very common. A lot of U.S. privateers, like in the Revolutionary War. Well, the Rebecca was a Royal Navy vessel, a frigate, a fast-moving ship. Not one of the big, like you would think of a battleship that had 100 guns. They call them ships of the line because they literally would line up and blaze away. Frigates were fast moving ships that would like escort or stop enemy ships. A lot of Royal Navy vessels, when they were patrolling the sea lanes here, remember Britain had like Jamaica was a colony and a few other islands. These are sugar islands. They're patrolling them. Jenkins would freelance as a privateer. If they saw a single Spanish galley, you can put your up. These are all sailing vessels, but kind of fatter. One that could haul gold or whatever it might be hauling back, cotton, corn back to Spain. He'd see one out in the middle of the sea, someplace in air. They'd capture it and steal the stuff. We'd stop them. And so Jenkins saw a Spanish galley. He knew they couldn't outrun him, just coming over the horizons. But, and so Jenkins did something he always did. He had the Rebecca take down the Union Jack, which not quite that flight. We're getting close to the Union Jack we have, we have today. We're about 100 years from that current flight. Take that flight down, 
and put it in the Spanish library. Hi, we're friends. And sail a little bit closer to where the gallon could not get away. Spanish flag come down, and what flag would he put up? A black flag. And captured. And they captured that ship. And he'd done that a number of times. Father out pirates would do it, they would capture it. They might hold the crew ransom or not. And, and then they would split, split the loot. Half would go to the captain and then the crew would split the other. That's how it looks. That's kind of like the tradition amongst ships. It's a big, easy money. It was trapped. Two Spanish frigates were over the horizon ready to jump them. And so the Rebecca with the sails down, raiding that ship, two Spanish frigates captured. And they roughed up the British. Actually, they thought about executing them right there. But they decided to send a message back. So they beat the crew up. They, the Spanish stole a bunch of stuff off of Rebecca and then sliced off Jenkinson. Sliced it off. Seven years later, that ear made it to Parliament. That's a plucky ear. Didn't quit. Didn't give up. That ear kept fighting and fighting and fighting and got back. So Britain was having... There's a few issues, and they're actually kind of looking for an excuse of the war, for war. And so they said, look what they did. Not only are Spanish ships stopping British ships, but they cut off an innocent captain who was just on a patrol mission. They cut off his ear, and they had the ear in a jar of rum. And the rum is only about 20 to 30 percent alcohol. And so can you imagine what that ear looked like after seven years? Yeah, it was probably very good. It was a gray thing and they pulled the ear out and they're like look at this ear and they passed it around to the members of parliament oh, look at this and they took it off this salons and shop look how evil the spanish is can you imagine how bad that ear smell now this is supposedly a picture of them showing the ear off at a salon which is think of like a coffee house that's the ear and britain went to war a four-year bloody war called the war of jenkins ear that would roll into another war. So I was at, in London, this is 2008, and I'm in line waiting to go to, into Parliament. And so I went to go, you can have a viewing session, you can watch them in session. I waited a long time, finally got in, my wife and I, and we, we're waiting in line, and I'm this long haul. So let's go to the viewing session for maybe five minutes. It was really cool, but it was about three and a half hours of standing. So it was a long, my feet were tired. And I'm standing in line, and they have all these things, like on the wall, various mementos and statues and plaques, little things on the wall. And I'm waiting right near the entrance go in. And I look over, and there's this jar. And it's kind of gray water. And there's this, like, thing that looked vaguely like a piece of cauliflower <laughs> floating. And I'm like, that's Jenkins here. Well, they won't let you take pictures then. There's, a, there's, there's signs all over, don't take pictures. And I'm standing, I'm kind of look, you know, doing, eh, I'm going to take a picture. And I carefully took my camera out, and I did another quick look, and, I brought, and there's nobody, no guards anywhere. And I thought, I'm going to get a picture. And like that, literally, this fast, and there's nobody hand on my shoulder. Let's go. I went to jail. And, <laughs> but that was, so I didn't get a picture of Jenkins' ear. But today they'll let you take it home. Britain's in a lot of economic trouble. No. Okay. <laughs> so that rolls into another war. The war, I'm sorry, King George's War. Don't write this down. It's a war of Austrian secession. That's another one. You don't need to know the European War. Start there, roll into the colonies, and here the British did quite well. Colonial militia won a series of battles here, but up here is a fort called Louisburg. And they took this fort, but they had to give it up. The treaty was another status quo anti bell. So here's the St. Lawrence River, and this is all New France right here. And all along the St. Lawrence River, Louisburg is right here. So any ships going in here have to go past Louisburg. So this is a really important fort. And the British took it. It's mostly colonists from Massachusetts, their militia. They had to give it up. They were furious. So the French held, but this is a precursor to bad times with the French. 
they know they're they're outnumbered and they might not do well. And this is going to lead right into oh, jump the gun here. The French have a problem. By 1750, there are 10 times more French, I'm sorry, British colonists than French. The Royal Navy, the French Navy is strong, but the Royal Navy is stronger. The French have to spend a lot of money on land forces because they're on the continent. They're vulnerable. The British don't need as big a land army, so they can spend more on the Royal Navy. So the French start thinking preventative war. They're thinking we're going to have to strike the British because someday they're going to attack us. And someday we're going to lose. So they're saying someday we're probably going to lose. We almost lost the King George's War, War of Austrian Secession. And so they're thinking along this frontier, we're going to have to strike. So a pre-empty strike is just imagine you have two countries and you're on your side and you look at the enemy and they're lining up weapons and tanks and they're going to attack. So you preempt their attack by strike. Preventative war, no, that's not happening, but you just have a feel someday they're going to get us. They hate me. And so they're going to attack me. And so they're thinking someday we have to go. You see how dangerous a preventative war is. Can anyone here predict the future? So you're saying someday they're going to attack you? Wouldn't this be used as an excuse to go to war anytime you want? Oh, we had no choice but to attack. They're, they hate me. They're going to attack. We know what they're going to do. So the South seceded after President Lincoln was elected in 1860. And therefore, knowingly, going to blow up the country. So we have a book out. So either I get a book, put that away, not again. Here we go. They were going to attack. Or I'm sorry, they decided to blow the whole country up because they were convinced that someday the North is going to take place. So we'll blow the whole thing. That's called a preventive war. Germany was convinced someday Russia and France were going to squash him, and that led to World War I. Someday. So yesterday was the anniversary of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attack on the United States. And that took people by shock by the ferocity of the attack, even though uh, there was just a whole series of screw-ups. And special topics of history would really go into detail. At the end of the year, we'll talk a little bit more about that. September 11th is the anniversary of that. And I should add one thing that's very interesting about that. It was a very traumatic event. In fact, I remember getting up in the morning and hearing on the radio uh, a small plane hitting the World Trade Center, but nothing to fear. The plane must have got lost. I mean, that's what the first report was. And then by the time I got to school, it was clear it was something else. I was in where Mr. Solomon is now, teacher of since retired. His room was there, and that's we were right before class. And the first of the towers went down, and that was shocking because we were told that the towers had been designed to handle a plane hitting. We have a, 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 a building that's over 100 stories high. The assumption was a plane, this could happen. Well, there were some engineering flaws they didn't take account of that led to a collapse. But they, they were saying, oh, it probably won't collapse. And then once that first one collapsed, it's actually the second one hit. You could imagine what everyone thought of it. What's going to happen to the second? He just knew. And so I was in my class in my first period. I was coming my age, teaching AP US history. It was that popular master. I'm moving this one the next year. We had a TV in that corner, <laughs> hanging on that wall. Let's see. Time flies, doesn't it? And we watched it. And this led to, I mean, just disbelief. It's the second bloodiest day in American history. Anybody know the bloodiest day in American history? Yes. One of the battles. 
September 17th, 1862, the Battle of Antietam. Battle of Antietam was a And maybe the most important battle in American history, that leads to the Emancipation Proclamation. Big deal. But, so, it was a whole series of screw ups. <laughs> the CIA actually helped the group that attacked the United States. So it was all, I mean, just looking back, I can't believe all this stuff. And uh, they were being hated by Saudi Arabia. It was a mess, but they were being, Afghanistan was in the middle of the civil war. They were in Afghanistan. So we joined the civil war and occupied Afghanistan. But two years later, the United States would use that attack as an excuse to invade another country that had nothing to do with the September 11th attack. And we said part of the reason was that they're someday going to have nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction as well, but we were told. And they might attack, AKA a preventative war. Do you see how I kind of brought that back? It's a reason I did that. What country did the US invade? Yeah, Iraq. Nothing to do with the September 11th. Actually, they were mortal enemies with the people who committed these September 11th attacks. But most Americans, you know, it just said. And yeah, it turned into a disaster. 5,000 Americans would die. 60,000 Americans would be wounded. Billion Americans would die. And we left in kind of an honest. Government, we didn't really want this. I was out of there. And that's a preventative war. So why am I telling you this? I did want to bring up September 11, but I want to tie it in. And the thing about it is that sometimes you might hear that history repeats itself, it doesn't. It's similar. Humans do similar things over and over again. It's never quite the same. And we are still, you know, humans have been around for some human, homo sapiens sapiens not have been around for such a short time. But man, we still do some. So, by the way, anybody know what homo sapiens sapiens is? Wise, wise humans. Wise, wise hominids. Homo sapiens, wise. We're wise, wise. So, back to this then. War! And that leads to the French and Indian War. And the French and Indian War, unlike those other wars, is going to start in what is now the United States and roll on to Europe and the rest of the world. The colonists called the French and Indian War because they're fighting the French and the French had American Indian allies. So did the British. The French and Indian War. And so, check what has happened. We have to bring up something. The Albany Plan of Union. So Benjamin Franklin was on his way to becoming one of the most famous people in the world. He printed a newspaper, a pamphlet, he wrote Poor Richard's Almanac, which we'll see in the video, so I'm going to kind of save it there. He was uh, a printer, relatively wealthy, kind of duplicitous, but you know, that's the way it goes. And he thought we needed a loose confederacy. The 13 colonists, and to his point of view, he really focused on this, but also these colonies down here. We need to unify at least a little bit. He's telling the other colonies. Because individually, we're being dominated by Britain, the mother country. We can't make deals individually with the various tribes. The various tribes can't really communicate. So that's part of the reason Franklin said they go to the French. And he wants to base it upon the Iroquois. The Iroquois were five by then, six Indian nations, six American Indian nations right here who had a loose confederacy. Okay, they were relatively independent tribes, but they would come together, especially when dealing with the French or the British. And they were able to maintain kind of a power base on the Finger Lakes and on this side of the Appalachian Mountains. And so we have to do that. We have to do that too, or individual colonies will be, basically these were being swamped by Britain. And if you've ever seen this one before, that came from his pamphlet advertising. It's a great picture of the snake cut up, join or die. I always liked that one. But it failed. The colonists were bickering and fighting. They had different land deals. It failed to work. They didn't like each other. Ironically, a decade later, the colonies got together. 
This time, they found a common enemy, and the enemy of my enemy becomes my friend. The colonies unified in what's going to be called the Stamp Act Congress. And they're mad at whom? The mother country, Britain. Now, let's be clear about it. The colonists still consider themselves British or English, they probably would have said. It. But they're mad at Britain. This also shows you how stupid British policy is going to be. And so let's get to the area that Franklin's saying we need to unify because everybody has a claim for the Ohio River Valley. Here's the Ohio River Valley. It starts up here in what is now Pennsylvania when the Mahongahia and Allegheny Rivers, Mahongahia, the Allegheny, run together right there. And this is rich for the fur trade. Remember what I told you about imperialism. They roll with the fur trade first. But after that, remember plantation owners, they want the land. And both the nation of Britain and France have a claim. I should have, what about the people who live there? They do have a claim and they're squashed in between them. First, the people in the middle have at least one thing going for them. As long as Britain and France are fighting each other, they might be able to, they might be able to survive. If Britain or France disappear, so there's only one colonial power, uh-oh. But they're not the only ones. I mentioned this before when I talked about Virginia. All the different colonies had a claim, too. The nation of Britain claimed this. France claimed this. So did Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts. Connecticut, New Jersey. Did I say Pennsylvania? I'm going to say it again. Pennsylvania. There. Delaware had a claim to it, and so did Virginia. They didn't want London to get it. Virginia wanted them to have it, part of Virginia colony. And so there's a race between all these different groups. Can they? The people that they hold on to it. The French have better relations, but they're going to try to get there first. The French are thinking about preventative war. <laughs> but Virginia plantation owners are becoming desperate. Tobacco, the price is dropping. Ironically, at the same time that the soil is getting worse and they run up against the mountains. So there's no more easy to get land. They got to jump over the mountains. Now, if you've ever been back east, and in the Appalachian Mountains. They might not seem like massive mountains compared to you know, the Rocky Mountains. We have some just towering peaks, majestic mountains. And these seem like pumps. But if you don't have a road and you're trying to haul stuff, this is a wall. So they've come up to this wall and they're going to have to try to find a pass and go through a massive effort to get over it. And so Virginia is stuck. And so they're trying to find a route over. The soil is declining. Almost forgot one other thing, too. The Ottoman Empire started drawing tobacco. And so now they have a competitor. What country today would be the center of what the Ottoman Empire does? You have Turkey, right here. They started growing tobacco. So now there's a competitor. Uh oh. Price is dropping. We need more land. Desperation. And every farmer is in debt. Farmers, okay, everybody's in debt. But farmers are always in debt. And debt is a crisis for farmers as long as there's been people tilling the soil. And we're talking ancient Samaria 4,000 years ago. Why? How many times a year can farmers sell their crop or their livestock? How many times a year? There's my hint. One. All it takes is one bad year, right? One bad year. And how do they survive? Or somebody. And then it's still worse. Agriculture, everything can be where they are. But agriculture is really susceptible. One bad year of bonding. Why do you think there's almost no farmers? It's incredibly hard, difficult work, and the debt issue. I mean, less than 1% of Americans are farmers. Heck, even Montana is not that many. Montana likes to claim their neighbor culture and say, no, most people are. It's only no one is. And most people who do have a farm, you should have another job. Or somebody does. So it's really hard. And there's other things we'll get to. So they're in debt. 
And then what do you do about the second or third son? If, you, if a plantation owner breaks up the plantation, then they have small little indebted plantations that with bad soil. But if they give it all to one son, then what happens to your second or third son if you have second or third sons? Yeah. Or you give them the work, you give that the second son the worst land. That's happened a lot. And the oldest son will get the main plantation. So the idea of the main family name, their plantation can survive. And so you have all these second and third sons who are thinking, I got to get here and get this land. That's a pretty good map, isn't it? That's from before this Revolutionary War. Isn't that a pretty good map? They were good map makers back then. Natural cartography skills. So what about that? And then how do we get money? Well, speculation. And speculation has a lure that it sucks in almost everybody. When I say speculation, I know you've heard that name before. Maybe anybody know what it means in this sense. Yeah. Stock market is speculation. Real estate is speculation. Yeah. Yeah. Some of you might expect down the road, but you have to, it's an investment. So you buy something. This, imagine if you're speculating. You want to buy something when the price is what? Low. And then you're hoping what will happen to the value of it down the road? Go up. So it's a gamble. You're rolling the dot. You're hoping that down the road it'll go up. And people do this with real, the biggest ones are real estate or the stock market. They roll the dot. I mean, Wall Street's a big casino. Everyone is gambling. And the allure of that is pretty overwhelming. The idea of making money without work. You think about buying something and just sitting back and waiting. And then a year later, you sell it and make money. Isn't that, a, isn't that just kind of... That's actually kind of an issue because unless you're already wealthy, you could lose everything. So speculation is a big risk. But it's amazing how many people time after time will make will gamble on speculation. And all you have to do is follow what happened with cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, how many people lost everything gambling in that. Why? Same deal. All I have to do is buy this and put the value on everything. Sure, but you figure once that happens, people will learn their lesson and never do it again. Never. They always will do it again. So I don't know why I yelled that, but I wanted to. So you have all these people. If we can get there first and get our claim, we know people want that land, and we can get rich. So much of American history are land speculators. By law, we already know that. So you have to write that down. Get the land claim first. These are all things I mentioned before. And gamble. I, I don't think you need to write that down. I put that in while thinking, but I already told you. We understand that process. I'm going to come back to speculation, obviously. There'll be a few crashes where the whole spec of the bubble will burst, including one in your lifetime to destroy the entire world's economy in your lifetime. Don't you feel good? Mine too. So at that, so in 1754, Britain wanted it first. Two years earlier, they sent a second son of one of those plantation owners who got terrible land. And he found out that the French were there. And so Virginia sent him again. He was given a rank of lieutenant colonel in the militia. His name was George Washington. And Washington was a land speculator. He was given this rotten land, um, almost no growth. Oh, yes, and of course, ladies. And then the bell rang, and that changed everything. So, tomorrow there will be a regular day, and then on Wednesday we'll watch that video. Oh, you can see my new plane. You want to see it? You want to watch? Dive bombed you. Pretty exciting, huh? Yeah.
I have no idea where this came from. I just found it in my desk. Oh, disaster. Have a good day, everybody. Right when you find work, hang by your thumb. I don't know. Isn't it just so there was one that you were going to have to take turns, and then there was another one that you have to work. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's another one that's going to have to work. It's like page 167 to 167 or something. But there's no terms that we know from it, and there's no, like, and you didn't, you didn't say it was, it's on the thing per se, but like, it doesn't say it's due. It's not like there's an assignment. Yeah, it's, it's just like it's a set of lines up. I don't know when you're supposed to do it, but. Well, it's a fan, but it's, it's a page, it's like a reading uh, thing in the chapter four. So I was like, uh, I don't know if it's an assignment or if it's like a uh, 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 But I don't have my You don't know if it's Well, I've the syntax, but I don't want to but I was like, what is it? Don't want to split the I guess it's I know yeah. You can do it by the Yeah. You don't have to sit in the street. Yeah. Go over to your parents. And it's working on Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. 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 Okay, so a couple of things in really quick.
And they're good, I, I see. They are very good. Good point. Yeah. Not quite Kit Kats, but you know, Kit Kats and Pringles, I think you're done. Okay. So, do two things for me. First off, so I just found out I am not going to be here on Wednesday. I know I feel your pain. I don't know how you're going to make it. And so I need to find something to do on that Wednesday. So everybody bring a shovel. I've decided I've, all, I've talked about this and it's been always my dream to build a moat around the school. So you guys are going to dig a moat. Who has gators? Alligators. On the class prepared. So. I was going to start that video I talked about the Revolutionary War part one today, but I'm going to say that for Wednesday because that makes sense. I literally just found out today I will not be here on Wednesday. And yeah, such a fun. And so with that, everyone take out that packet for World War uh, for that's a World War One. The World War One packet we just gave a few years. I've decided you guys don't need that whole Civil War thing. Revolution at war, you're fine, you'll get that. And then I won't sign some of these documents down the road. I pick and choose what I want us to read. But open up to page three, just really quick so we get that organized. And I'm doing it now so I do so I do not forget. Because I know there's a very good shot I would forget to tell you yes, or tell you tomorrow. It's on my mind, I'll tell you now. And Back. 